Good afternoon and welcome CFTC colleagues. My name is Tanisha Cole Edmonds and I am the Director of the Office of Minority and Women Inclusion and the Chief Diversity Officer for the CFTC. I'm so excited to open this program and welcome Professor Elena Romero, who's going to be joining us, who is joining us today, this afternoon for a, a, a wonderful presentation uh, honoring hip hop fashion and, and style and the legacy of hip hop. And as, a, as someone who grew up during the early days of hip hop, I'm, I'm so excited to, to hear her presentation, followed by a fireside chat uh, live from the New York Regional Office between Professor Romero and Commissioner Kristen Johnson. Before we get started, I just want to thank Professor Romero for taking the time to join us today. I also want to thank the Association of African Americans Affinity Group Chair Camille Arnold and co-chairs Lauren Chrysler and Judith Slowly for their collaboration and support of this event. And I also want to uh, acknowledge and thank Associate Director John Sim and EEO Specialist Sarah Pauly from my team for all their work in putting this together. If you have not had a chance to do so, please be sure to check out the feature block, the Black History Month feature block on the CFTC intranet for more information and resources about Black History Month. The Office of Minority and Women Inclusion is honored to produce programs that celebrate our nation's rich cultural heritage and your ideas for future speakers and program topics are welcome. So please feel free to share with us at OMWI, O-M-W-I at cftc.gov. I am very pleased now to introduce to you Chairman Rostin Benham to provide opening remarks and introduce Professor Romero. Chairman Benham, thank you for joining us and over to you. Thanks, Tanisha, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I want to welcome everyone from our DC office, but also New York, which is where our guest speaker is today, uh, and welcome Professor Romero. Um, also, Kansas City and Chicago as well. And I did just take a quick moment before we begin, and I, I start the introduction, do want to take a moment and recognize our colleagues in Kansas City. We're certainly thinking of you. Uh, and all those in Kansas City um, in the aftermath of the tragic shooting um, a few weeks ago during the Super Bowl parade. Um, as some of you may know, the origins of Black History Month uh, began in 1915 when Dr. Carter G. Woodson and some friends traveled from D.C. to Chicago to participate in the Lincoln Jubilee, which was a national celebration commemorating the 50th anniversary of emancipation. Dr. Woodson joined by many other exhibitors with Black History Displays and inspired by this celebration formed what became the Association for the Study of African American Life and History, which today seeks to promote, research, preserve, interpret, and disseminate information about Black life, history, and culture to the larger global community. Dr. Woodson's work eventually led to the first Negro History Week in 1926, which eventually expanded to become Black History Month 50 years later in 1976. Now, what some of you may not know is that Dr. Woodson's home is here in D.C., just across town on 9th and Q Street in the Shaw District. It's from here that much of Dr. Woodson's work in research, publication, and service occurred and served as the headquarters for the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. The historic home is currently being renovated by the National Park Service, but is planned to reopen this spring. So I would encourage anyone, if you're ever in the neighborhood, those visiting Washington, or for those of us who live in the Washington area, certainly encourage you to stop by. I'm sure it's a great uh, place to learn a little bit more about Dr. Woodson. Today, we continue celebrating, remembering, and recognizing the many accomplishments of Black African Americans. This year, the national theme for Black History Month is African Americans and the Arts. The Association for the Study of African American Life and History notes that whether it's in the field of visual and performing arts, literature, fashion, folklore, language, film, music, architecture, culinary, or other forms of cultural expression, the African American influence has been paramount. Whether it's a blues song by Muddy Waters, a poem by Mickey, Nikki Giovanni, or the choreography of Alvin Ailey, Black American creators have set the standard 
for popular trends around the world. And I would echo Tanisha's comment uh, about Black History Month and more, more notably the 50th anniversary of hip hop last year, certainly growing up in the past 40 to 50 years, watching the explosion and the influence and the impact that hip hop has had on American culture, American society, and quite frankly, global society has been remarkable to watch and experience firsthand. Today, I am particularly pleased to welcome our featured speaker to help us deepen our awareness and appreciation of the contributions of African Americans in the arts, and in particular at the intersection of hip hop and fashion. Professor Elena Romero is the assistant chair in the marketing communications department of the Jay and Patty Baker School of Business and Technology at the Fashion Institute of Technology. She is a hip hop fashion scholar, author, an exhibition curator, and has worked as an award-winning journalist for 30 years. Her work and expertise has been featured in Honey, Savoy, Vibe, Latina, Urban Latino, Sportswear International, USA Today, Vogue, Netflix documentaries, and CNBC. Her hip-hop fashion expertise is highlighted in the CNN documentary, Fresh Dress, and current Netflix documentary, The Remix, Hip Hop and Fashion. She has also appeared as a fashion expert on CNBC's The Brave Ones, featuring the story of Damon John of the fashion brand FUBU, and CNBC's Suddenly Obsessed about skate brand Vans and its relationship with hip hop, as well as In Vogue, the 1990s, sorry, In Vogue, the 1990s, a podcast about the decade that changed us. Professor Romero is also the author of Freestyling, How Hip Hop Changed the Fashion Industry. Last year, Professor Romero served as the co-curator of Fresh Fly Fabulous, 50 Years of Hip Hop Style at the Museum at Fashion Institute of Technology. The exhibit was featured on Good Morning America and explored the roots and evolution of hip hop style. And Professor Romero has co-edited a book by that same name. She holds degrees in journalism, mass communication and publishing from NYU, is pursuing her PhD in urban education from the CUNY Graduate Center and she and her three daughters live in Brooklyn. Professor Romero, thank you so much for joining us and sharing your expertise with our workforce. I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to hear your presentation. And I'd also, before handing over the mic to Professor Romero, want to extend a sincere thanks to the chair and co-chairs of the CFTC's Association of African American Affinity Groups for their input and collaboration, collaboration in organizing this wonderful event, as well as to our OMWI staff, to our telecom team, and of course, Commissioner Johnson, who we are lucky to have her co-host and moderate a conversation professor with, with Professor Romero in a bit for all of their support, certainly in putting to get together today's event. So without further ado and that long introduction, which was well-deserved for sure, I'm now gonna hand it over to Professor Romero for any remarks she'd like to make and then the rest of our um, event today. Professor Romero. Great, thank you so much. Before I begin, I just wanna give my thank yous up front uh, to the U.S. Commodity Futures Trading Commission, as well as you, Chairman Benham, and Commissioner Kristen Johnson, who I'll have the pleasure of having a fireside chat in a little bit, along with uh, Tanisha Cole Edmonds um, and everyone that made this uh, presentation possible today. So we're going to get started with my presentation, uh, titled the same name of my book and recent curation, Fresh Fly Fabulous, 50 Years of Hip Hop Style. And we can move on to the next slide. So I thought before I give you a very formal introduction to the topic, I'd tell you a little bit about myself uh, and my origins. I'm originally from Brooklyn, New York. I'm part of Gen X, which is part of the hip hop generation. So I myself as, am as old as hip hop. Uh, that should give you some context. Uh, in fact, the photo that I have there is of about an 18-year-old self attending NYU at that time. And these are two copies of my recent books. Uh, it's important to note that Gen X currently uh, is about 65 million people. And our soundtrack was very much like a mixtape. We listened to all sorts of music growing up. Thinking about hip hop, think of us as, as really children, young adults and teens, uh, creating this culture that infused both music and a number of other uh, genres. We listened to punk, funk, disco, pop, reggae, heavy metal, salsa, and of course, created hip hop. I grew up watching uh, 
shows like Ralph McDaniel's video Music Box in the early 80s, running home from school at 3.30 to see myself, visions of myself and friends who were creating this music and would become our superstars way before MTV put it on its screens. Next. So before I get into the introduction and the intersectionality of hip hop and style, just wanted to give a very, very brief overview. Uh, famed hip hop photographer Ernie Penacoli has made it very clear in stating that hip hop sound existed well before 1973, but we're using 1973 at that particular intersectionality where the culture was really kind of deemed and created. Uh, DJ Cool Herc is credited for throwing the legendary party, and we cannot leave out his sister Cindy, who helped market it uh, back on August 11 of 1973 at 1520 Sedgwick Avenue. And interesting enough, it was a very inexpensive way to party. We're talking about 25 cents for girls and 50 cents for guys to have a good time. The term hip hop introduced um, six years later into popular culture. And with that, we talked then the next slide about what these elements would include. So when we talk about hip hop per se, we're talking about the elements of the DJ, the MC, the B-boy and B-girl, who mainstream media would classify as break dancers, aerosol artists, which were also known as graffiti artists, and then knowledge is also a major component of culture. But with that, the culture is going to birth a certain style and uh, fashion, and many have called fashion that sixth unofficial element of hip hop. What you're seeing on this particular screen is just a small tidbit from the exhibition that I curated. We had over 150 objects spanning 50 years. Many of these objects were the first time, in fact, that private collectors had allowed us to put it in public display. So we had a number of custom outfits from different um, custom designers as well as stylists. We had uh, a lot of borrowed objects and then some objects that were permanently part of our museum at FIT collection. Next. So I thought I'd start off with a quote that kind of sums up the importance and vitality of hip hop style and fashion. And it's a quote that I um, use quite often to kind of open up my talks. And that's that hip hop became the Black Panther of the fashion industry. It turned the fashion industry upside down and inside out. It forced diversity onto an industry that had not attempted to see the value in hiring, designing, marketing, and celebrating people of color. And it changed the face of the runway from bald heads and braids, larger frames and big booties to adding various shades of black beauty. But most importantly, it spoke the language manufacturers and retailers understood best. It made dollars and sets. Play off the word sets. Next. So I can't bring you to the exhibition since it was only exhibited for a short amount of time in New York City, but I thought I'd share a one minute installation link so you could at least see how long it took to put this miraculous uh, exhibition together. One of the largest hip hop style exhibitions to date, although there have been many others at many other museums, including the Brooklyn Museum here in New York City. So if someone could click the link, you can see what you missed.
as I mentioned, that exhibit was uh, up February to April of 2023, and it was one of the largest exhibitions in attendance for the museum to date. We had folks from all over the country visit the exhibition, and what made me most proud was that we had the most male attendance, and also we had families attending. So we saw multiple generations coming to share their stories of fashion and style. Uh, move, move on to the next slide. So what I thought I'd do was sh just share just some key elements. Of course, there are many more than what I'm about to present. And the themes that we had in our exhibition to kind of help tell that style story. So we focused on hip hop fashion spaces. We looked at the streets and nightclubs. And so early hip hop styles were really outtakes of current fashion trends in the late 70s and 80s uh, remixed. And so places like Disco Fever in the Bronx were places where you would see young gentlemen and women wearing everything from Kangol hats and gazelle glasses to Lee jeans and Puma and Adidas sneakers, sheepskin jackets, leather, of course. Um, these were outfits that you would be seeing on uh, entertainers like Slick Rick and LL Cool J, many of them incorporating lyrics, fashion lyrics, to talk about their wares. Uh, one of the hip hop groups that we focused quite a bit on in the exhibition was the Get Fresh crew, of which Slick Rick was a part of. Um, when we think of that particular group, we think of kind of Harlem Fly, and that group was comprised of Dougie Fresh, uh, D-Day, uh, Chuck Will, Barry B, and of course, MC Ricky D, better known as Slick Rick the Ruler. Uh, and his song um, had a number of references, specifically Lottie Dottie Dottie is one that we talked quite a bit in our exhibition, where they talked about the importance of wearing polo cologne and wearing Gucci down to the socks, even though in fact they were not wearing that. And as they sang, um, one of the most sampled songs in hip hop history. Next slide. So we moved from the clubs and the streets to having uh, part of the exhibit looking at Afrocentricity and looking at not only the music promoting uh, being black and proud, but also fashion. Uh, a brand by the name of Cross Colors that came out of the West Coast, created by Carl Jones and TJ Walker, was one of the earlier urban fashion brands that proved that uh, urban fashion was a legitimate fashion force. From 1990 to 1994, the brand uh, brought in $100 million between its uh, US brand and its licensees. There were a number of hip hop uh, groups at in the time uh, wearing, moving their stage costumes onto streetwear. And we started seeing the incorporation of African beads and medallions, African cloth, um, as a way of really promoting the black power movement and black pride. Uh, something that's reminiscent, of course, of the civil rights movement of the 1960, many of Gen X being the children of such. Next slide. Of course, when we think about hip hop, the baggy years and baggy jeans always comes to mind. The 1990s is probably one of the most synonymous looks in hip hop, uh, streetwear designers, as I mentioned, like cross colors on the West Coast. But out here on the East Coast, we had uh, Brooklyn designer Carl Kanai, who would later move to Los Angeles, and our female pioneer April Walker of the legendary brand Walkerwear, creating really innovative silhouettes and trousers, um, really focusing on fit. So you, this is kind of where you have a much more looser silhouette. And you had early hip hop celebrities like the notorious B.I.G. really wearing Carl Kanai, uh, as well as uh, Sean Puffy Combs as in one of the advertisement images that I have on the left. Uh, Tupac Shakur wearing walk aware. And of course, we can't forget the ladies, uh, the group TLC uh, wearing cross colors, it really in a, in a unisex way. Next slide. 
media is very important in promoting hip hop because we start seeing the crossover of the artists. And so television and film uh, <laughs> become very important conduits in promoting it now on the national platform and eventually global. Uh, I mentioned Ralph McDaniels earlier, his show uh, starting in the 1980s predated MTV raps, bringing hip hop to television. And he is very well known for many things, including Can I Give a Shout Out? allowing those who are airing on his show to shout out their friends in their local area. Again, another wonderful element of introducing the ordinary person to the television set and allowing them to be seen. We had a number of television shows that were critical in promoting hip hop style, including Arsenio Hall's evening program, In Living Color, uh, Fox's New York Undercover, Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, just to name a few. Now, although these were fictional tales within these television programming, the dress of the characters was very realistic in what we were seeing in New York City and throughout the United States. Next slide. So it's important to note that early hip hop superstars dressed themselves. This is all before large wardrobe budgets and music video budgets. And so the hip hop stylist is a critical component of promoting hip hop style. In this slide, I have an image of Misa Hilton, very well known as working with many of her fashion muses, including Little Kim, Miss, uh, uh, Mary J. Blige, and Missy Elliott, to name a few and uh, the group Jodeci. Uh, we had a number of custom uh, customized looks that either a celebrity stylist would commission or the hip hop artists themselves would go to. So many know the name Dapper Dan in Harlem, who recently has been doing a collaboration with The Gap. Many would head to Harlem to get his custom wares, like Eric B and Rakim, who were recently nominated for by uh, Rock and Roll's Hall of Fame. MC Shan and LL Cool J would go locally in Queens uh, to shop at the Mighty Shirt Kings, being seen at the Jamaica Coliseum Mall in Queens. So there were a lot of different words that are associated with uh, dressing up, whether it was getting dipped or fresh to death or dope or jiggy, whatever you would call it. It's always been about originality and standing out from the crowd. And we have to give credit to those style architects like Amisa Hilton and June Amros and so many others who have been really the architects behind some of the, today's most fashionable and influential uh, styles of our era. Many recall Misa Hilton's 1999 VMA look for Little Kim when she's wearing the lavender outfit with a little uh, paisley. Um, and that outfit is one of the most uh, recognizable looks be besides Jennifer Lopez and that Versace green dress. Next slide. <laughs> Many may not think the color pink is a color that's associated with hip hop, but in pink, it's all its various hues, both men and women have used the color as a way to uh, promote their individuality. Uh, many don't realize that the color pink in terms of history really started in the men's category and would later move on to being kind of associated with women. Uh, there are plenty of artists who have made pink their signature from Little Kim to Nicki Minaj, who've been really unapologetic about asserting their femininity and many male artists as well, including Kanye West wearing Ralph Lauren's traditional pink polo. And of course, uh, we also have Cameron who's famous, uh, New York runway fashion week image in fur is one of the most recognizable pink images for men. Uh, next slide. We cannot ignore the designer influence on hip hop. Who influenced who? Did the streets influence hip hop or did the designers influence hip hop? Now these lines are very blurred, but in fact, it was the street that influenced the designers. Uh, one of the images that I have here is of a very young Snoop Dogg on Saturday Night Live wearing Tommy Hilfiger. As soon as he wore that particular stripe rugby, sales went up dramatically, seeing really the connection between the hip hop persona celebrity with retail. Uh, Ray Kwan of the group Wu-Tang Clan out of Staten Island, again, wearing uh, the snow beach jacket from Ralph Lauren, another popular look. And young men out of Brownsville uh, making polo really a staple within Brooklyn with, and in a movement that really hit worldwide. Uh, 
So we see that there is definitely a connection between the designer and the hip hop persona, as well as the hip hop consumer. Next. Hip hop parade. So we see that the hip hop celebrities have become very important and fashion becomes part of creating their image, but they're not just satisfied with wearing the clothes. They want to be a part of the business as well. And so we've seen over the last 30 years, a number of hip hop moguls as well as rap artists decide that they want to create their own clothing lines from Damon John, uh, Damon Dash and Jay-Z creating Rockaware, uh, Wu-Tang Clan creating Wu Wear, uh, Naughty by Nature out of New Jersey creating Naughty Gear. They at one point did retail as well as Wu Tang Clan, and Sean Puffy Combs now P Diddy or Love Combs uh, with his namesake brand Sean John. Even Beyonce and a number of other female artists, including Eve, have created their own brands. Uh, one of the earlier Beyonce brands was House of Darion, as you see in the image in the right hand corner. Next. So tailor made uh, an, a very important aspect of hip hop style is customization It's something that we've seen throughout the decades. It's really one of the best ways to be original and unique and stand out. And of course, customization is critical to uh, the role that hip in hip hop. So we know many know the name Dapper Dan out of Harlem, but there are other Harlem tailors and 5001 flavors, very, very important and instrumental in promoting many of the bad boy artists of the 1990s. April Walker of Walkerware, known also for customization. She worked with a number of rap groups, including Audio 2. Uh, the Shirt Kings out of Queens, very important for t-shirts and airbrushing techniques. Uh, and of course, this kind of paves the way or kind of this idea of DIY, you know, on a personal level. Uh, many of us look at these unique styles as something that continues uh, now uh, with the next stage would be collaborations with celebrities and designer or European uh, brands. Next. So we see hip hop in high fashion. Now we see just about every important hip hop celebrity being featured in various ad campaigns from MCM to Terry Mugler to Louis Vuitton, from Megan Thee Stallion to Little Kim to 21 Savage. The luxury and hip hop really go hand in hand. Many times it was aspirational. Hip hop celebrities had not uh, seen themselves, um, but we had shows like Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous showing us a particular lifestyle that seemed once unattainable. And now our hip hop celebrities were front and center in those very same storylines. Next. And we see that not only is there a designer influence, but of course the red carpet or hip hop glam. Uh, these are two of my favorite outfits that I had featured in the exhibition. Uh, one is of Megan the Stallion wearing Moschino, and then one of Chance the Rapper wearing custom uh, Ralph Lauren, part of the 1992 Stadium Series. A stadium, um, and that particular Stadium Series is very important uh, because it's one of the uh, important fashion styles that the low lives in Brownsville, Brooklyn helped make popular. Next. And where we are today, we're seeing quite a bit of collaboration. So as hip hop has gone mainstream, we're starting to see now the collaboration between the hip hop artists and major brands. These collaborations are kind of creating limited edition of wares. Um, we've seen it really from the early days of Run DMC when they signed with Adidas. Uh, just as a fact note, uh, Run DMC had created the first million dollar endorsement deal with Adidas, the first uh, non athletic uh, group to have signed. Uh, and then we have other collaborations that include Fenty uh, by Puma, which is a Rihanna collaboration, and even Cardi B with Reebok. So by the 2010s, we saw designers um, were really hand in hand with the hip hop aesthetic and the celebrity, really having them break into mainstream and recognizing them not only for their creative genius, but their style uh, abilities. Next. So 
I made the presentation very short, but I have quite a number of links that would uh, give you the opportunity to learn more. And I'll share that with all of you, uh, a link of an article that I wrote on the 25 best dressed rappers of all time. I've also created a Spotify hip hop style playlist as well as a reading list. And if you wanna enjoy some of the uh, items that we had in our exhibition, we had a collaboration ourselves with Bloomberg Connects and you'll be able to see all of that and much, much more. So with that, this concludes my uh, presentation and I throw it back to you, Tanisha. Let's stay connected. I've provided my social media handles where you can follow me on IG, on X and Facebook to learn more about events and upcoming uh, projects that I'm working on. Thank you. Professor Romero, Thank you so much for that presentation. I, I could have listened to you for another hour learning more mm -hmm. about the intersection of hip hop and fashion and just so many memories. As I recall, all of the different looks that you, show, you showed, I forgot about the little Kim look. So that was, that was fun to hear more about the background behind that and just so many of the uh, hip hop inflection points between fashion and and uh, and style in the in the industry. So thank you so much for sharing your time and your expertise with us. And I certainly will make sure that we share those additional information links to the CFTC community. And I would be remiss if I did not take a moment here to acknowledge special counsel Alicia Lewis, who I know is a friend and and colleague of you, Professor Romero, and who was instrumental in, in connecting us with you. So thank you, Alicia, uh, for, for your contribution to getting this incredible presentation to the CFTC. And now we're going to transition to the fireside chat between Professor Romero and Commissioner Kristen Johnson. Commissioner Johnson, thank you so much for joining us. You are always so generous with your time and lending your support and your voice to our commemorative month events here at the CFTC. And thank you for supporting this event in particular with Professor Romero here in the New York Regional Office. I am and sure everyone is excited to hear more from you and the professor. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to you, Commissioner. Thank you. Oh, thanks so much, Tanisha. Um, first, I have to apologize. I was sick over the weekend. I have a little cold, and I don't know if it's fully um, sort of addressed. So if I step away to cough or sneeze or something, please forgive me. I um, have to say thank you so much, Professor Romero, for joining us. Um, it's a tremendous treat for us. You asked me whether our community would be excited about the program, and I think the answer is obviously an enthusiastic yes. Um, it's just um, great to see uh, the talent um, that you've captured in the context of the exhibits over decades of time in the context of the music industry and at the intersection of music and finance or music and finance. That's awesome. Ah, fashion. <laughs> but I'm but finance, finance is a very I'm big component. Finance. Yes. I'm coming to finance. It was already on my mind. So as you can tell, <laughs> maybe never been far from my mind. Um, but I also really just quickly want to thank everyone in the New York office who came to sit and join us. Um, and also especially thank everyone who worked behind the scenes to gather quickly um, sort of a, uh, a stage for us, if you will, um, for today's program. I love getting to the New York office as often as I can. Very excited to get to the Kansas City office and I'm thoughtful uh, alongside the chair about folks there and everything that's happening in that community. We have a big conference there in April, so that'll be really a fantastic time for us to come together as a community. Um, and I'm thoughtful about sort of just reaching uh, each of the offices through the programming that Sanisha's office puts together annually, which is so rich and thoughtful. So Without further ado about the CFTC, we really are in the finance space. And so there really is a justifiable question. I mean, apart from the fact that I have tons of questions about your favorite hip hop artist, song, style, all kinds of things. I will not dig into that right away, but I will kind of ask a question pulling on threads that I heard across the presentation um, and questions. I think you asked some questions in the context of the presentation that really are thought provoking around the extent to which the artists are the point of origin or the point of origin is other spaces. So specifically zoning in on artists who had very successful branding 
um, or marketing programs around fashion. One of the questions I have is whether or not it really takes some level of um, success in hip hop, right? Whether or not it's like the most successful artist. Beyonce is easy to imagine, right? Launching a line. But then there are others who, when you think about it, were possibly like setting the stage, setting the tone very early on from the first days they took the mic or were on the stage. So I'm just curious to know if you feel like there's a, a very clear dynamic, a very clear trajectory. Success in hip hop means success in fashion or the other way around. Like what is the solution? If it was so easy, right? <laughs> um, I will say that once the hip hop artists recognized their brand worth, okay, right? They had to achieve a certain level of success they realized that they were only getting but so much mm -hmm. out of concert merchandise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there needed to be other ways to really be able to maximize their mm -hmm. potential. Mm -hmm. uh, there have been many, many artists who have gone into the fashion industry. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the earlier rap artists that I interviewed as a fashion reporter for Women's Wear and DNR in the 1990s mm -hmm. was Chuck D from the group Public mm -hmm. Enemy. Mm -hmm. who Public Enemy, created we also need his... a soundtrack, obviously, Oh, right? yes. We needed a soundtrack for your presentation. <laughs> Like just a little intro for like every every random reference. I mean, that would have done. So it. Chuck created Rap Style International. In fact, Chuck getting into the clothing business, then Vinnie Brown from Naughty by Nature went mm -hmm. to him for advice. Mm -hmm. And as they also saw, mm -hmm. so as the artists saw, you know, their their growth and popularity, mm -hmm. and that meant an upgrade, yeah. right, in their brand image, in yeah. their trademark, how could they maximize mm -hmm. wealth? And so one of the easier ways mm -hmm. was to move beyond concept merchandise. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them started with catalogs mm -hmm. and then kind of went into the wholesale business. Uh, only a few like Naughty by Nature with no the Naughty Gear store in Newark, New Jersey, and then Wu-Tang Clan's Wu Wear. They had about five stores throughout the United States, predominantly in the Philly and Staten Island flagship store. Someone in to wholesale and retail but really quickly you know they at the the it was a number of artists and moguls mm. that really were breaking into the business at the end of the day those who understood business mm. right so this is where finance so really comes key. in right yeah. you know it's not just enough to be a fashion muse it's mm. not just enough to have a sense of style. You have to really understand the business and what that means and what that takes. Um, and so I think those who were instrumental in not just being the face mm -hmm. of the brand, yeah. but doing some of the day-to-day -day and you know hard work, it paid off. There also seems to be a little bit of a trajectory, if you will, between people figuring out that wearing something like the Tommy Hilfiger shirt that would sell out creating let's go with dividends for Tommy Hilfiger shareholders, right? But not necessarily for Snoop Dogg at that sort of Saturday Night Live performance. Might have prompted some to recognize that the revenue streams, right, would come to them not just from setting the tone in terms of fashion, but from manufacturing it, right? So that, that's definitely got a piece of the puzzle. And, you know, that, that example that I gave of Snoop Dogg, Andy Hilfiger, who was really the right hand to his brother Tommy, mm -hmm. was behind, you know, the 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 marketing of the Tommy Jeans brand. Mm -hmm. And so he product placed the apparel on Snoop, who he had known for a while. Snoop was in town. He gave him some clothes. You know, then you don't really know who's going to wear what. Mm -hmm. And then the moment came. Tommy called up Andy, turn on the television. Look who's wearing my stuff. And then, you know, the rest is history. Well, also, it seems to be a faster track than ever before to some to merchandising something. So I'm going to reference, um, and I think there's at least a fashion element of this. I know there's a beauty element to this. Rihanna's um, makeup line, and I think she also has some clothing as well for Fenty. Am I making that up? Is that true? Makeup, clothes, yep. footwear. Yeah. So something to note is that the fashion that has kind of fallen under hip hop style and fashion really stemmed from the young men's fashion category. So it really came out of the men's business. And then those brands. Oh, that's in interesting. The 2000s, even women at some point. TLC is almost wearing sort of men's shirts and baggy You used to dress very and, androgynous. Yeah. I mean, we kind of think about that particular time period. And in part, mm -hmm. women downplayed their femininity those female rappers yep. for many of the reasons, because it was kind of like a, a, a boy's network, right? Yep. And mm -hmm. to kind of prove themselves to take away from having the attention be oh, upon their persona, yeah. they wanted the attention to be really on their lyrics. So okay. in the beginning, they pressed down, you know, and kind of played down their femininity. Yeah. We start seeing later 
um, over time. I would say, you know, salt and pepper is a great example of how they did a nice transition mm -hmm. and we start moving in that direction. So by the time we get to little Kim, mm -hmm. you know, it's all out flaunting it mm -hmm. and using We're it as, as, a, as a power <laughs> statement. <laughs> well, and, and, and that beget, you know, little Kim right. then beget and beget, right? Yeah, party. Where I we guess are we have to now, stop at party right? before we get to Megan. Right. right. I hear you. And, 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 you know, that becomes now a powerful weapon or tool of purpose okay. to not now downplay it, but to flaunt it. Yeah. Well, there there are definitely seem to be a, so many interesting threads here, especially at the intersection of um, sort of gender and hip hop, right? Like our talk, our conversation around this is really focused on, and maybe one piece of this is that in the beginning, so many men, I mean, so many of the rappers that dominate the space are men. And the hip hop genre is really um, not nearly as, um, gender, uh, the, the gender equity is not nearly there, right? So there's Queen Latifah and MC Light, but that's like you, you got to be no, you got to know that that's what's happening in the space to, to land all those ladies. By now, there, there's just tons of women in the space, and so there's something really interesting there about the the move and the trajectory over time. Um, and also, I guess to your point, the kinds of products that are associated with hip hop, sort of expanding into makeup or into sort of shoes, but beyond sort of sneakers into Who, something. Who has hotels, for example? Oh, wow. and also have a well. This is very Samsung interesting. You say and, more. And and, and oh, so <laughs> okay. In terms of product lines, yeah. there isn't a product extension that hip hop cannot touch. Yeah. This is really interesting. So I have more about entrepreneurship and where hip hop has gone. But one of the questions I have for you, which I didn't share earlier, so forgive me if you feel taken aback by it's this. Okay. I feel like you could handle it. I mean, you live in Brooklyn, so you got this. But honestly, I'm a little bit thoughtful about um, online platforms. So you were describing in earliest days, Wu-Tang, any number of other artists who have a local storefront brick and mortar shop and how they would reach the masses by going into Newark or going into Queens or going into Brooklyn and, and sort of opening up a store. Um, today, nobody has to do that necessarily. All you need is a platform online. You need a web page. So do you think some element of how technology has evolved and the access sort of to information and also the potential for sales and distribution? I mean, I think was... Um, who was selling out of the back of their car? Damon Dash. I feel like somebody was selling. Many Damon, of, yeah, many, many of the earlier brands was, was were, definitely were selling, selling not only in the back of their car, but local flea markets, mm -hmm. right? Uh, the idea of figuring out many of the, the musicians and early designers yeah. were not people who necessarily studied mm -hmm. fashion per mm -hmm. se. They kind of learned in their own kind of school of hard knocks. Yeah. And then breaking into traditional retail outlets, mm -hmm. your mom and pop specialty stores mm -hmm. were the ones who built this business. Yeah. And then this idea of kind of crossing over, mm -hmm. wanting to know what it's like on the other side is to then be doing, and have an doing the big display. major department yeah. store business. Yeah. And for some brands, that might have been the kiss of death if they didn't have yeah. the proper infrastructure mm -hmm. to be able to work with that kind of volume sales, mm -hmm. um, which in some ways, then there was a move away from the mom and pop who had yeah. built that business. So mm -hmm. the the relationship of, of the building of that particular sector of the industry is complicated because mm -hmm. really it was started off with mom and pop specialty stores that moved into then regional chains and eventually department stores. Right. And then at some point, we then see that the internet plays a much, oh, much yeah, larger role. Mm -hmm. uh, but nonetheless, the, the business infrastructure is still the same. It's not an either or. It's mm -hmm. not doing it's online both only both, or right? both. Yeah. And for the celebrity, it's about you know getting the product in as many hands as possible. Mm -hmm. So I want to pull on one more thread and a theme that was part of um, certainly a very visual part of one of the slides that you offered up, but I'm just curious to know where you think it has gone or if it's still present. And that is what feels like um, an African diaspora connection, right? So you had a, a slide that had Queen Latifah and she's wearing sort of um, what, what looks like a kente styled mm -hmm. or kente printed dress or, or, or shirt. Um, she, you mentioned she's wearing African beads. Um, we're all deeply aware of the extent to which hip hop in general is influenced by um, the African diaspora. Of course. So to the extent we're thinking about the world as we've evolved, do you feel like there's continuing sort of threads that that sort of pull on both in the music and the fashion, some elements of, of sort of that diaspora? It, it's never gone away. Mm -hmm. I mean, that in essence is, is another 
another theme that you're going to see throughout with each generation. It's how they interpret that in the, in their own personal style and in also in their music. Mm. So what I think what we're seeing now, um, and we've seen it with, you know, natural hair movement, natural skin, you know, yeah. um, Alicia, Alicia Keys, for Keys, example, who has stayed, you know, true, you know, stunned we, at the, we just at saw the, yeah, so she- Right, you know, has stayed true into (laughs) the idea of all natural. Yep. Um, so we're seeing it in various extensions, and it's not just um in apparel, Mm -hmm. but we're also seeing it in various hair trends, which Mm -hmm. is another, you know, I wasn't able to talk about every single trend that we could touch upon. Hair is another wonderful area in how we keep again roots tied to Afrocentricity, but also personal individual uh styles for both men and women. Oh my goodness. Okay, so I want to pause to make sure we're are we allowed to take questions from others? We also may be out of time. I just don't want to get the boot or the hook or anything else. And we are we're not going to watch time. So somebody will have to tell us that it's time for us to, to check out. Okay, so I want to push into what is our what our markets look like. So we are um derivatives markets regulators. So this is going to be fun. <laughs> <laughs> because now we're going to apply derivatives law to fashion and hip hop and talk a little bit about what it would mean to think about, to your point earlier, you know, the complexity, the intricacies of building multinational businesses, right? Building businesses where there's not just a single product line in music, but there are multiple products that are derivative of that music. So first there's the song and the performance, but then there's also what you're wearing in the context of the song and the performance. And first that might include you know, the specific clothing that you're wearing, but then it might also include um, custom-made jewelry at some points in time, yes, custom-made so I, shoes. I didn't touch upon Oh, jewelry. we didn't even see those. Yeah. <laughs> um, jewelry for yep. women, jewelry, nails is another great aspect of self-expression. Mm-hmm. Um, hoops are very much associated in hip hop as well as name plated jewelry. Um, I need a name. When plate. I think this about Commissioner John getting, <laughs> getting a name chain or name earrings was really almost like a rite of passage for many young teenage girls. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and the, the, and they're coming back. So the herringbone necklaces. Well, they haven't like, been gone. They, they haven't gone okay, away. No, no, no. I, I in it. fact, <laughs> I'm going to give you a tip. I donated my original brass buckle name belt to the museum at FIT. That belt was probably created around 1982 or three. Mm-hmm. And I recently purchased on 30th and Broadway my new customized oh my recent belt. So, you know, what's old is new again, because again, it's Fantastic. the rediscovery, reinterpretation of a style and never is old. Fantastic. I um so one other thing I want to talk a little bit about. You mentioned cross colors. Yeah. And I remember when cross colors hit the scene. So this is going back again to this sort of set of threads and set of cross issues. colors is back. Many is other, it really? Yeah. Back. Okay, it I'm is. not catching up. I'm so, not keeping up. <laughs> you know, again, there's a lot to talk about. We yeah. have a limited amount of time, but many of the originators, yeah. cross colors, April Walk or Carl Kanai, uh Fubu, yeah, have all come back yeah. because again, there's this rediscovery because it's now almost. called vintage. Oh, that's fantastic. That's fantastic. So actually those t-shirts, somebody was selling for $5 out of their trunk uh, during the concert. Today, that t-shirt is probably pretty valuable. Yeah. You right. can go okay. on so eBay and buy some vintage beer. Increasing over time, like appreciation uh, of, of various commodities over time. And there's t-shirts new count. stuff too. So it's we not just the vintage, but also the new stuff as well. Yeah. <laughs> but I think what you're saying about the potential to reinvent or um, enjoy the rebirth of um, pre-existing styles is kind of wildly interesting because we know that it's true generally, but it's 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 hard. I think for certain moments, I didn't see certain things in hip hop. They weren't as apparent on the surface, but for you to say that they're resurfacing is really interesting. And new interpretations. A great example mm. is looking at the... Uh, Country or cowboy trend. Mm-hmm. I probably know that Beyonce just dropped, you know, a yes. country album. Mm-hmm. But not only is she dropping a country album, but on the style side, you had Pharrell, who's now yes. head designer of Louis Vuitton, taking over Virgil's place. Mm-hmm. Had a very big country mm-hmm. western feel. Yes. And Dapper Dan, who has a collaboration with the Gap, also his interpretation of western. So you're going to see. So that's interesting because of the if you think about the historic trends of, um, you know, sort of very specific moments in the history of America. We have Black History Month. We think about Black History Month. Um, I was at an event recently at the White House and the vice president said, um, you know, Black history is American history. And part of the reason that she's saying that is we almost have just not taken enough time to acknowledge in the same moment that X is happening, Y is happening, right? So one of the the groups I'm thoughtful about that you're referencing that definitely goes to the heart of our markets is um, the Buffalo Bill Cowboys, Black Cowboys, Mm -hmm. and thinking about an era where that was definitely part of um, the masculinity 
um, of black male masculinity and sort of thinking through that trend and seeing it reemerge in urban sort of hip hop. Discussion. Well, in fact, in the 1990s, a brand called Mecca USA did a whole right. advertising campaign around the black high boy. So yeah. these are these are not necessarily new ideas. Mm -hmm. They're just reintroduced yeah. to another audience or to a new generation. Right. Mm -hmm. Because part of the dilemma is uh, you have an entire generation sort of come and go and young folks show up and they're sort of like, oh, they're they were black cowboys. They're like, yeah, that's why we're teaching history, because we don't we want you to know and be familiar with the notion that these threads, that these themes have been part of the history of the country, of different cultures um, for the entirety of the history of our nation. Basically. And it's important to know that hip hop style and fashion is American fashion. That's we right. tend to look at it as something different mm -hmm. and then kind of othering mm -hmm. that in the very same way that those creators and originators have been othered in past his industry. So yeah. it's important to understand that pop you know hip hop is american culture yep. in the very same way that style some hip hop style is american style and for some generations it is the most um prevalent um point of access for american culture so i'm thinking about many parts of the world where hip hop has had a really profound impact and the entrepreneurs and artists in the hip hop space have really deeply influenced the culture of parts of the world that are not very near us at all, right? So proximity is not the issue at all. There's something about the style of the music, the culture, the approach that really is resonating, right? So easy for us if we're in Brooklyn and Queens, if we're in um, New Jersey, right? We're just, we're sort of getting infused right where we are. But it's seemingly um, really telling that all of that, which is uh, all of the attributes that are easily celebrated about hip hop, resonate with people on the other side of the world who are really excited, an entire generation of young people. Or I mean, people. we didn't even get to talk about art. Yeah. You know, where you had uh, Spike Lee recently have his creative spaces so, yeah. at the Brooklyn Museum. And more recently, Alicia Keys and, and her husband, Swiss Beats, has their Giants exhibition. So, again, there's so many different elements. I was wondering where Swiss Beats was when Usher was dancing with Alicia Keys. I was, like, very concerned. For, everybody was like, we're Swiss Beats, we're Swiss Beats. But we, we were sure it's fine. Um, okay. So is there anything else you want to share with us? And I don't know if we take any questions, but I definitely now know I'm watching the clock and I don't want to be given the hook. So... We're listening to any questions, but more than happy folks to. online. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yes, we do have a number of questions. We oh, are gosh, going sorry. To Not a good mind. I was supposed to. <laughs> <laughs> we are, we're going to transition to um, our chair of the Association of African Americans Affinity Group in about two minutes, but I think we have time for maybe one or two questions, Professor. Okay. And about while you dig the question out, Tanisha, I'll just say thanks so much to the, the previous co chairs and incoming co chairs for the African American Affinity Group. Tremendous thanks to you for all the hard work you did to bring today's program to together and for the many other programs you've helped put together for the commission. Absolutely. Thank you, Commissioner, for that. Uh, Professor, I'm going to take the first question that came in, and uh, sure. if we have time, we'll, we'll take a few more. Uh, the first question is, is hip hop here to stay, and will there be a resurrection of R&B? Oh, it's great. <laughs> Yes, hip hop is here to stay. You have to think of hip hop as not only rap music, it is one of the elements of hip hop culture. So remember, there is art, there is dance, there is DJ. So hip hop, yes, is here to stay. What will happen is that it has it will continue to evolve and it may look very different than what it looked like from its original roots. Uh, and there's also a very, you know, connect. there is a, a connection between R&B and hip hop as well. When you think of groups, now I'm going, you know, deep into the music nostalgia, groups like Guy, for example, oh, wow. um, Keep Sweat, mm -hmm. you know, um, you know, the list goes, I'll be sure. And I can go on and on. Elder Barge. Um, Elder Bar you know, yes, you can go <laughs> on and on in terms of art. So I think, you know, there's always that synergy between the two. Um, so I think that they're, they're, they're both can coexist. We have time for one more question. Okay, sure. What is the role of authenticity in hip hop and how have the markers of authenticity changed in the hip hop's 50 year history? Oh, that's a great well, question. That's a really, really long, uh, <laughs> complicated question. To I'll try to simplify it as much as I can. I think of it, I really, it, it kind of, boils down to how it's marketed, right? And the people behind the brands. And I think uh, to some degree, uh, you can create the look 
and you can sell it in the right places, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to resonate with the end consumer. The end consumer is very smart in being able to tell kind of the real from the fake and the real and the or, or the, the counterfeit, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of it has to do with marketing and how the product is brought out to market, where it's sold, how it's packaged, and who's associated with those brands in terms of celebrity or, or, or well-known uh, personalities. Great. Thank you, Professor. There are so many more questions here in the chat, and, and that, that just is a tribute to you and, and just the incredible information and expertise you shared with us. I wish we could get to all of the questions, but I want to be sure that we leave time to transition to our chair of the Association of African American Affinity Group, Camille Arnold. Thank you again, Commissioner Johnson and Professor Romero. Thank, Thank you. So Thank you. Thank you, Tanisha, Professor Romero, and Commissioner Johnson. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Camille Arnold, and I serve as the current chair of the CFTC's African American Affinity Group. We certainly received a number of questions, and we will share the questions with Professor Romero and hope to be able to provide a response. Thank you again, Professor Romero. What a wonderful presentation and discussion with Commissioner Johnson. Fashion is such an important pillar of the American economy. It's amazing to hear about this genre's contribution to that industry. Uh, thank you, Professor Romero, for your scholarship and your artistry and for sharing with us today. I will now turn to the co-chairs of the African American Affinity Group for their closing remarks. Thank you, Judy and Lauren. Thank you, Camille, and I echo your sentiments, Professor Romero and Commissioner Johnson. Thank you so much for a stimulating discussion. Greetings, everyone. I'm Judith Slowly, a futures trading investigator in the Division of Enforcement's New York office, and I'd like to use this time to direct you to the new trailblazing addition to the Commission's intranet homepage. You'll see the colorful block entitled Celebrating Black History Month 2024. It was mentioned at the top of the program today. You can click on that block to choose a listing of literary works by Black authors to indulge in and or view some amazing artwork by some pro prolific African-American artists. Don't forget to check out the music links. They offer you the options to see a historic opera perform performance by Marian Anderson or signature masterpieces by the Alvin Ailey Dance Company. Perhaps you'll also enjoy being energized by the wholesome beats of neo soul music, or also being soothed by the melodic sounds of steel pan music, complete with visuals of the Caribbean, all of which are part of Black culture. I'm going to turn the mic over to Lauren Chrysler, the other co chair of the African American Affinity Group. Good afternoon. My name is Lauren Chrysler, and I'm the program manager of the Controlled and Classified Information Program in the Records and CUI office based in Washington, D.C. I'm also one of the co-chairs of the African American Affinity Group, and there are several exciting activities and initiatives planned for this year. If you're not currently a member, please email aaaffinitygroup at cftc.gov for more information. We look forward to meeting you. Next up is Camille Arnold, our chair of the Affinity Group. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, Judy. You know, there's a saying, it takes a village to raise a child, talking to the diaspora. Well, it certainly takes a village to put on a program like this. So as we turn to our acknowledgments, we thank you so much again, Professor Romero. Thank you to our chairman, Chairman Venom, for your support and warm welcome. Commissioner Johnson, for your engaging discussion. Tanisha Cole Edmonds and the Omni Office, John Sim, Sarah Pauly, it has been a delight to work with you. The New York Office for hosting Professor Romero, the telecom team. We are in front of the cameras because you are behind the scenes, but we see you and we acknowledge you. Our predecessors, Jeanette Curtis, Tamara Durbin, and the incomparable Alicia Lewis, thank you for your guidance and support and saving the best for last. Thank you to all of you who joined us today. Thank you for your interest. Thank you for your time. And thank you for sharing the space with us. We will see you soon. Be well. This concludes our program.